Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Alexandra McLeod. I'm the head of branded programming at Women is One. I'm thrilled to be here with you tonight to launch part four of the Women is One Leadership Academy with a virtual screening of industry relationships, what's important. This video is the final one in a series of four that feature interviews from global women leaders on key leadership topics. Just a few quick housekeeping notes before I introduce our participants for tonight. Um, a quick reminder that this webinar, as well as all previous ones, have been recorded and are available on the Women is One talent directory, and as well as on the Women is One YouTube channel. Um, and tonight's event will feature a screening of the video, followed by a moderated panel discussion and audience Q&A. And for that Q&A, if you can please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen, that would be great. Now I'd like to introduce our wonderful participants in tonight's event. Um, first and foremost, our moderator, Dr. Roxana Moran, co-founder of Women's One and the director of interventional cardiovascular research and clinical trials at the Zena and Michael Wiener Cardiovascular Institute at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And our panelist, Dr. Bobby Bogave, medical director, heart failure at Abiumed. Michelle Calope, vice president, Cardiovascular and Established Brands at Bristol Myers Squibb, Paul Kyatt, Head of Global Training, Education and Market Enablement, Image Guided Therapy Devices at Philips, and Linda Minarchik, U.S. Coronary and Endovascular Medical Education Manager at Abbott. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight, and thank you to everyone who's watching tonight. We're so excited that you can join us. Um, and now I'm very pleased to share with everyone um, the video screening of um, industry relationships, what's important. I was of the era in medical school where um, your stethoscope came from industry, your textbooks came from industry, uh, your pads and your pens. During my residency is when uh, you know, sea change and you wouldn't get anything that was meaningful from industry because industry was tainted and it somehow uh, had impacted uh, your decisions. I was still a trainee and um, I was asked to join the steering committee of a small trial. Um, and I remember the fear. I had it in my mind that industry was the dark side and that, oh my goodness, I'm getting close to the dark side. Guard up, guard up. I think perhaps I was taught to be more suspicious of industry than is useful in our profession, because I think the relationship, particularly in cardiology with industry and academia is really critical and has been part of our ability to innovate fast and well and it, gives our patients huge benefits that we wouldn't get if we did not trust every captain of industry that came along offering to help. I'm fortunate that I trained at a place that really has a uh, wide exposure to all sorts of different funding mechanisms for research. Government funded, foundationally funded, and industry funded. There's nothing really that says government funding is absolutely good, nor is there anything that says industry funding is absolutely bad. The young me would say I've turned into Darth Vader. I have literally, oh my goodness, gone all the other way. But uh, let me explain this. I say it proudly. I say it humbly. I basically wanted to start a, a large heart failure registry across Asia. I learned that they will give a grant to allow investigators to do their own research. I had no idea that industry partners did that. And I was lucky enough to benefit from that. And it has completely changed my career um, because after being able to do this registry, I could, you know, get to know and have a network across Asia and I could then turn it into something that became a network for trials and, and so on. You know, it, it just, um, it would not have been possible at all. If academics don't work with industry, then we don't further the field. We have to do those phase three trials. Uh, somebody has to test the new devices. By 
by, you know, just interacting with people from industry in that first experience, I realized they're human too. They're good people too. They were trying to help patients with, with new medications and so on. It's all trying to help patients. So, so okay, um, we've got something in common there. One of the things an academic cardiologist brings to the table is integrity. You should never compromise integrity for anything. And that's something people need to be very careful about, regardless of what kind of relationship they're engaging in. As long as you're able to make sure that you are, you know, true to those principles, then I think these relationships are all very, very similar to each other. And that disclosure part is very important. Disclose, disclose, disclose. Relationships with industry are clearly important, but anything that's really important, you got to protect. And so it's critically important that you be open, that you be transparent, uh, that you disclose conflicts, and uh, you adhere to policy and procedure. As long as you've got clear boundaries and you understand what you're doing for them and what's expected of you, and, and where you would draw the line. I think that can work well, but it's just about thinking about it. I would not engage in any project where the science does not excite me, first and foremost. I cannot give a talk where the industry tells me exactly what to say and I can't say anything else. Number one is to look at, for example, the consulting and to ask, is this actually marketing? If it's kind of too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. You're probably doing some promotional marketing. When talking to pharma reps, I've always thought I have a lot of respect for that person, but, but if, for example, I'm being offered a stent that hasn't got the data that three other stents have, I'm going to keep being polite to that person, but I'm going to continue to use the stents that I know are well proven. And, and I will be honest with them. I'll say, look, I'm using these stents because of these trials. Um, when the data matches, I'll be happy to, um, to reconsider. Showing respect, but respecting the data and the patient's right to have the medicine that is the most well proven is, is how I try to negotiate that relationship. So I think I've really, really learned to respect what, what each party brings. Um, they, they have a wealth of experience. They've got resources um, that, that I just, as an academic, cannot possibly have. Um, there's also a synergism. We set up a meeting um, trying to talk about uh, women in cardiology and our underrepresentation, particularly in Australia and New Zealand. And I had been talking with one of our reps about this. And uh, one of our reps said, I'd love to set up a meeting so that you can discuss your paper. We'd had a paper in Jack and one in circulation and you can engage with uh, more women who might be interested in getting into cardiology. And that was just what we needed. And it came with no strings attached. Uh, and it was a great meeting. It wasn't a huge meeting, but it was a great meeting that uh, was led by us, but organized by the company. And that was a brilliant relationship that if I had remained suspicious would never have happened and was a real opportunity for lots of people. One of the things I've really enjoyed about having partnerships with industry is, is really understanding different perspectives on research. Sometimes my industry colleagues have more um, up-to-date knowledge about how the field is going. Other times it's really about you know certain ways of doing research that I've never considered before. There are you know both from a content standpoint as well as from a methodologic standpoint um, some really great lessons that I've learned from industry colleagues. I think one of the key tips I would have about developing relationships with industry is ask your mentor to connect you. I think that's actually the most effective way to really network well um, and network effectively. I'm just so grateful uh, to the then PI of that industry um, um, sponsored trial who just thought that my opinion, because I was kind of really in this hef world and in echo, would, would help. And, and so he 
gave me that first taste of it. And that was actually the door, the crack that opened, because then it's, it's I think as in everything we do, if you do a good job, um, be enthusiastic, um, people kind of start saying, oh, she's value add. Two words, be brave, go find. There are lots of mentors out there. One of the things I think women tend to think a little bit more about is, well, maybe I should get something under my belt before I start talking to someone. And I would say that while that's a great sentiment, it, it really does hold you back in terms of being able to network effectively. Relationships with industry are learning experiences. I've seen it more like a partnership, um, but with very clear boundaries. And that, I think, is the most critical thing for any young person who wants to be involved in industry must, must, must remember. Remember where your own boundary ends. If and when we do it right, I think that's good for the field. And we have to um, try as hard as possible to do it right. And we have ourselves as well as our medical editors and our leaders to watchdog us. Uh, because if we don't watchdog ourselves, uh, someone else will. Well, thank you, Ali. That was a fantastic, uh, fantastic watch with three four amazing leaders across the globe, uh, mm -hmm. Carolyn Lamb, uh, Noel Barry Mertz, um, Tracy Wong, and who's our last one? I Sonia think. Burgess. Oh yes, Sonia Burgess, of course, from Australia. What a what fantastic group. Thank you for, uh, for sharing that. And, and I think, you know, taking away their uh, top, top advice of being brave, um, diving in and working with industry that they're not all evil. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's a great synergy and wonderful way to build and innovate and uh, improve patient outcome. But it's partnership with clear boundaries and we must do it right. And I think those were sort of my takeaways that were fantastic. So let's start our uh, conversation in the next uh, uh, 45, 50 minutes or so where we could uh, really um, dive in and uh, and uh, deeply into this. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us, Dr. Bogave, um, uh, Linda uh, Minarchek, Paul Hyatt, and Michelle Kalopi. It's wonderful to have you all. And if it's okay, I'm gonna call you with your first names, if that's okay, so we can be easy. And I'm Roxana. Uh, so uh, this, is a, this is a great venue. So let's start with you, Bobby. You heard Carolyn Lamb, uh, an expert in the world uh, in heart failure. Uh, talk so openly about how important it was for her to engage um, uh, with industry. And I know that you come from an academic background yourself and now just recently joined Abiomed. Um, so you've been on both sides um, and now you're working um, as, as head of heart failure for Abiomed. Um, tell me your perspective as a woman in academia who's now uh, joined um, industry. And in what way um, did you work with industry and what was, how did that experience um, help shape your, um, where you are today? Um, well, first of all, Roxana, thanks so much for the opportunity to be part of your women as one. And as you mentioned, I spent actually 20 years in clinical medicine and recently transitioned to Abiumed as a medical director. I've spent those 20 years uh, focusing on advanced heart failure. So essentially taking care of patients who required mechanical circulatory support. And that in the early days fostered a relationship with industry. Um, the early devices um, were designed by engineers who really didn't understand um, the clinical execution of those devices. For example, um, the Abicor, which was the first total artificial heart was so large that not one woman received an abiocor. And so although my 
bachelor's of sciences in mechanical engineering, as a clinician, I saw the gap between the engineers who were designing devices and the clinicians who were trying to use those devices to assist patients. Um, so after 20 years, as the field of mechanical circuitry support has advanced, I still today see a gap and an unmet need. And that was the compelling reason um, that I was recruited to AbbeyMed, is to assist with upcoming clinical trials, to provide clinical input to the engineers who are designing devices, and to the scientists who are designing clinical trials. Um, what I've been surprised about is in adjoining industry, they actually employ PhDs. They're concerned about advancing the field and the science um, and not, uh, not simply just selling their devices. And so it's been refreshing on this side to see that there is a true partnership and a desire to want to help physicians and women in particular advance in their careers as well as to meet the needs of our patients. And many times those women patients don't always benefit from sex specific outcome analysis of clinical studies. No, no, it's really important. And it's just nice to, I wanted to start with you because I know you were on both sides and wanted to get sort of a little bit of a sense of uh, uh, perhaps an, exam, um, an example of how you worked with industry beforehand and now you're sort of on the other side. But I can tell you myself, I mean, there's no question. I, I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't collaborate and work in partnership with my industry colleagues from development phase all the way from phase one through four studies. It's incredibly important in both drugs and devices. So going to you, Michelle, uh, as someone who's uh, leading... Uh, in a, a massive uh, pharma and a huge pharma uh, place where I know that you're looking for diversity in your, um, in your boards and on, on so many different levels. I've personally visited uh, BMS and have been incredibly, incredibly um, impressed with the kinds of work that you're all doing there to be sure that there's equal representation, et cetera. And it's not just about the patients, but it's about working relationship with, uh, with physicians. This has been going around for years and years for as long as anyone can remember before even my generation, uh, doctors and, uh, you know, physicians and industry have worked together to, uh, to make innovation happen. And it's been a fantastic, fantastic synergy. But in what way are you working at BMS? Uh, and it would be really nice to, to note that because I've been on several, um, uh, advisory boards. And I have to say that the boards and the advice and the principal investigators of the large trials are mostly, if not all, are, are mostly, if not all, um, uh, male dominated. So how do we, how do we um, change that narrative and give us an example of a collaboration with a physician that has actually been mutually beneficial Santa for the opportunity to, to join the, the panel and the discussion um, today. So I think, um, so I'll give you my perspective. So from a Bristol Myers Squibb, um, you know, we, like many of our peer companies, really do feel like um, diversity and inclusion is such an important um, part, as you said, not just for patients, but to bring innovation, to bring those diverse ideas. And so we've made commitments um, both in terms of diversity of clinical trials. Um, we're partnering currently with, um, with a, um, ACC to think about how do we help elevate uh, the skill sets for clinical trial investigators, right? Because um, that's not a skill set you just, you, you develop overnight, right? So how do we continue to invest so that people can be clinical trial investigators? Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, so I have also spent for my 29 years in the, industry, uh, I have spent a time abroad, and I know you have participants from around the world, uh, but we had a situation when I was in Australia, as an example, where we partnered with a group of melanoma expert physicians. Um, two of the lead investigators happened to be female oncologists, but what we realized is if we didn't join forces, patients weren't going to have access to medicine, right? So we had done, we had partnered with them on development, um, but when it came to actually access to, to medicines, 
Um, we worked together to generate real world evidence. So it was a collaboration between advocacy, between the physicians, the pharma industry, I think as your participants in the video said, bringing all of our resources together to convince the government that in real life patients, we had safe and effective medicines and they should, patients should have access to them. Um, so that's just one example uh, in Australia. It took us over two years to do that. So it took much longer than it would maybe here in the US or in other markets. But it's an example of you know, how we've come together um, because with the patients at the center, um, we can bring all of that diverse experience to, to make things happen that we could none of us could have done alone. No, I mean, it's, it's incredible. I mean, what can be done uh, through collaboration. So um, maybe I'll go to Paul next. Um, Paul, I know you work very, very closely as you're developing, um, as you're developing uh, uh, programs and uh, choosing, how do you find ways to, to work with physicians? And uh, how do you, how do you choose uh, the physicians to work with you? Yeah, first off, like my uh, peers mentioned, thank you for the opportunity to join this distinguished panel. And I, I love the initiative first and foremost, uh, having opportunities to have dialogue like this, I think opens up uh, channels for us to, to learn from each other from a educational standpoint. So for us on the Phillips side, since I have uh, three businesses that our team supports from coronary peripheral to part with the management, a, a big part of it for us is trying to understand from our physician partners, what's of interest to them as well. And I can tell you that for us, it's been a um, educational journey. Uh, early on, we probably made some assumptions in terms of what the interests are. Uh, I'm sure some of us have as well, in terms of what our physician partners are really interested in. But at the same time, it's really having that collaborative approach in trying to co-create educational solutions together. Um, I, I think this past year, honestly, has been a really interesting one besides the obvious of what's going on globally, but as we have spent time, I'd say over the last eight to nine months in um, educational forums like this with various societies on a global perspective, what you tend to realize is that we all have uh, common challenges and problems that we're trying to solve collectively from an educational perspective. And I, I think that's been fun for us, both on the industry side and on the physician side to identify that there are similar challenges and also similar opportunities for us to address together. And for us trying to understand exactly what those challenges are, what the opportunities are to co-create together and even to cross pollinate across societies that typically don't work together. And I think that's actually been a, a lot of fun as we continue to live in this virtual world is bringing groups of physicians that typically don't work together from let's say the EP side to the coronary side to the peripheral side and what you start to realize is that the opportunity from an educational perspective to cross pollinate, to learn from one another um, is pretty robust and pretty robust on a global scale as well. So as we try to figure out exactly um, whom that we want to partner with, it's a selection process, honestly, Roxanne, on both sides. It's, I think, as much the physicians trying to figure out um, what projects they want to work with us on or industry on in general. And then I think also industry trying to identify exactly which physicians from a not only a disease state perspective, but I think, as Michelle pointed out, also a geographic perspective of, of how we want to collaborate together. But um, I love the fact that there's already a common theme that goes to the, the partnership perspective of what we try to do because at, at the end of the day, we all have a common mission. There's a, a warm body, as we say, um, on the table, which is our, our patient that we're trying to bring uh, care to. And I think for us, that's a, a, a common opportunity as we try to bring uh, care, whether it's from the pharmaceutical, biotech side, medical device side, I think there's a, a lot of great opportunity to leverage learnings and also learn from each other. Um, and I think as uh, Bobby had alluded to, you know, Phillips, we have, I think, 5,000 PhDs that are in the Netherlands. And I think as most of them probably started to go through training, their path diverted one way <laughs> and our clinicians path diverted a different way. But what we try to accomplish, I don't think that really changed. We just probably took a, a bit of a different approach as to how we want to do it. No, I mean, it's, it's really uh, clearly refreshing to hear the cross pollination is just so important to work across disciplines and uh, 
especially both in the pharma world, I would imagine, as well as the, uh, the device world. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about the vaccine that's being developed now and how important it is to understand all of the issues because the virus is attacking all of the, the entire system of the body. And, and so it's not just infectious disease or virology, but rather um, you know, cardiovascular, pulmonary, vascular, neuro neurologic, et cetera. So having that kind of a cross-pollination of the ability to be able to, uh, to work across the disciplines through the networking is tremendous. And, um, you know, when, when I'm hearing you guys, it really is um, kind of um, making a really huge case that working with industry is such a positive uh, so, Linda, coming to you um, as someone who heads up education and manages education at Abbott, um, how do you uh, work with physicians? How do you choose uh, the educational platforms uh, and get away from the male domination that we are all watching of the, of the men teaching all of us? And how do you choose to have some uh, uh, female representation in the, in, especially on the educational side. Uh, so I'd like to, in addition to the, the rest of the panel, I wouldn't want to thank everybody for the opportunity. This is quite an honor to be on one of your first calls. So in terms of selecting faculty, we first look at where are, where are their interests? Where are their passions? Um, and how diversified can we get this? Not just from maybe a, you know, a gender or race, but from a geography standpoint. Like how can we really reach across all geographies? And I think now, since we've all been just pulled into this virtual world, the cross collaboration is actually quite effective these days because we're not, we're not restricted by travel, right? So I think to answer your question first, we look at our, our KOLs, key opinion leaders, um, that have expressed an interest. We quickly learn their passion, what, what they want to be involved in, what drives them. And we, and I can try, I could tell you as industry, we will never forget that. You know, we always really remember what the passions are behind each of our clinicians. And when opportunity comes up, we, we make sure that we really align with those passions and their visions. In, in terms of like looking at faculty selection, we go from, you know, who is out there, who's published, who is, who's on the podium, because essentially if you're trying to move a therapy or a device, you know, um, you know, information or best practices forward, you have to really look at some of the people that have a really wide body of knowledge and a wide body of experience. Um, and, and in terms of best practices and outcomes, right? If you're going to be working with them on publications or, or maybe like Paul and I, we work in education, you know, we want to make sure that we provide faculty to train other clinicians that really have um, maybe outcomes and volume and the experience to speak to that. But I think, you know, these days where we can very quickly um, contact or get on a webinar with anybody, I think it really has opened up a lot of doors, especially in this setting. So there's, there's a lot of silver linings in this situation and just being able to connect with people worldwide has been one of them. So what I'm hearing is that there's huge opportunities to work for industry, that you are waiting open arms to, to work with uh, clinicians and that you understand those boundaries. Uh, and, um, you're, and what I loved uh, about what you said is that on the educational side, to be chosen to be a speaker or a key opinion leader, you really do have to have the background, not just the gender and race, but also the background around that publications and and it sometimes becomes sort of a um, a self-fulfilling prophecy of uh, women and, and underrepresented minorities are less often um, writing papers because they're busy and they're not really being asked by their colleagues to lead anything and that it, they might do all the work but they don't get to write. And there's a lot of things that we're hearing and you on the industry side are watching this and it's really the, the first the person who's first publishing or a senior author, first or second author. And they may not, women, those people may never make it to the, to the thing. So what I'm hearing is you wanna make sure they're talented. You wanna make sure that they have the, um, the expertise, of course, but you're also 
have an open uh, dialogue where they can approach you. I mean, I think most of the time physicians are saying, well, I need to be chosen. So how does, how can a clinician um, approach you, Bobby, if they want to be um, a principal investigator in one of the trials in the life cycle of what you guys are choosing? Because what I'm seeing is sometimes we end up of getting comfortable with the same PIs over and over again. And it's the same old guys sort of rotating through a rotation. Uh, and uh, we're trying to mix it up a little bit and give you guys, and I think it's going to be a much better place uh, to be at. So how should physicians uh, approach um, you, Bobby? Let's go with you, Bobby. So Roxanna, I think um, Linda brought up one good point is as a physician, express your desire and your passion to your, your industry colleagues. And certainly um, that starts the dialogue. Um, I will say that at AbbeyMed, uh, we've established a women's heart initiative so that we are very intentional about including women in various roles. And in my short duration here, I've been very intentional about steering committee meeting uh, members for um, clinical studies, that there is representation from women, as well as on technical committees and medical therapy committees. Um, furthermore, on our advisory boards, um, including representation not only of a distribution geographically and a diversity, um, but, but also physicians from different sectors, not all from academic institutions, some from community institutions, but it's important for those physicians to have some sort of leadership role, whether it's in a community setting or an academic setting. And certainly um, mentorship from a senior mentor also helps with not only the publications and the presentation, but to introduce um, physicians to those industry partners. Um, many industries, including Abiumed, will help fund investigator initiated studies. Um, so again, initiating those conversations, expressing your passion, um, and then that starts the dialogue and we can take it from there and what best way with an industry partnership that's within the boundaries that would benefit both the physician, um, benefit science, um, and there are multiple, multiple possibilities. So is that through like a website or do they, uh, how do they like, do they work with the, the, the representative and the liaisons? I mean, it's very, very difficult to get yes. to the meat of the game, you know, it really, really is. So I want to try to make it easy for our uh, listeners. Uh, so is it through a website? So let's say there's an investigator initiated study. Somebody has a great idea of an investigator initiated study, and then you'll look at it and you'll say, you know, this is a good question. Uh, we might want to do this, but, you know, this person is not really qualified to do this. But, you know, if we do end up doing this, maybe we'll put this person on the committee, on one of the committees. Is that how it works? Is that, is that a way forward? Um, I just want to know, is it, is it through a website, Bobby? Um, right now, we don't have a website, but certainly anyone can ma uh, email myself or any of our medical directors. And I'm rbogave at abumed.com. Uh, to express any desire for an investigator initiated study, and we can take it from there. But I will uh, introduce the idea of a website. I like that, having a, a centralized area where physicians can submit their ideas and they can be screened and we can start the communication. And certainly you do bring up a good point. If there's not the infrastructure or experience from a physician who has a good idea, partnering that physician with others who may have better infrastructure support or more experience in a clinical trial or in a retrospective analysis, that will allow the physician to bring forth their idea and be a part of it, but set them up for success um, as we investigate the question at hand. Great, Michelle? Yeah, I think I'd agree with, with what Bobby said. I, I do think if you come through one of our, our professional websites I do think, you know, reaching out to other, uh, for the physicians, reaching out to your peers to find an industry represent, representative, whether it's a sales rep or an MSL, and all that information comes back. So, you know, for everyone who writes us um, or through a 
personal contact. I, and an I, MSL, for those of you who are sorry, listening, yes. is medical science, science liaison. liaison. Right. And that's existing in in uh, in a lot of the large pharma companies, not so much in devices, right? Uh, so, but but certainly at BMS, there is a medical science liaison who will always make time to to sit with you, listen to you, hear you out, and then make a connection with some of the leadership, especially if there is a, a good idea and a and a. And it fits within what what it is that um, perhaps a specific company is looking to do. Yeah. Is that right? Is that a good way? That's forward? absolutely a good first step forward. It is, uh, Roxana. Paul, Paul, yeah, that's great. So, Paul, it's a little bit different um, for device companies. Uh, do you want to do you want to talk about how uh, how what advice you give to physicians who want to work with Philips, for example? Sure, I I I agree with Michelle and Bobby. Um, in, in terms of what's been shared already. I think there's uh, so many different avenues to connect with our industry, whether it's pharma or device. There's channels like the science liaison group that the pharmaceutical companies have and the device have, companies have not probably to the same infrastructure. There's certainly uh, a mentorship aspect of it. I, I do see some of our academic centers globally that are forward thinking in nature that have already started some of these mentorship programs that focus on diversity and inclusion, looking at gender, um, ethnicity, to try to really broaden the spectrum. And I applaud those um, institutions for going in that direction. I also think that societies play a, a huge role in this as well. And I, I love some of the um, initiatives. If I look at, and I know Roxana, you're involved with Sky and the uh, ELM, the Early Leadership Mentors Program, because there are avenues that are out there that start to prepare um, those interested in uh, participating, whether it's in research, uh, publications, education. I, I think there's a, a lot of avenues that are available out there. Um, I, I think it's um, an opportunity for us in partnerships like this to create awareness of what all those channels are. And I also do agree that has been mentioned by the panel, um, you have to raise your hand as well, right? So it's helpful for us to really understand who's interested, um, understand specifically what they're interested in. And if they come to us, whether it's through our channels, our sales teams, our science liaisons, societies, academic centers, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities, but I go back, Roxana, to what you said, there's a lot of opportunity that's there. And I think just as, on the physician side or clinician side as, as you're trying to figure out exactly what it is that you wanna do. Um, I, I think we all want to communicate the message to the participants that there's so much opportunity there and that we're looking and trying to identify just like you're trying to identify exactly what those interests are and trying to figure out where that common ground is. And I'd say that's probably true for all of us on a global scale. So the more that we can create awareness, whether it's creation of websites or further collaborations like this, uh, I think it certainly would be beneficial to all of our um, participants um, in this program to ensure that they're aware of what those channels are available to them. Yeah, no, definitely. So, you know, I wanna sort of switch gears a little bit because I mean, what you're hearing and what everyone is hearing uh, on, this, uh, on this webinar, and I know we have lots of people um, signing on is, to, is, is that there is an, there's a lot of different pathways to, to work with industry that, uh, and all doors are pretty much open uh, and that this isn't uh, a panacea. I mean, there is a very, very clear path in wanting uh, to, to get on there, but there is a little bit of a circular ar argument for some of the physicians who are struggling to get up on the podium to then be recognized, to then be then having what Linda was looking for is, is yes, are they on the podium? Are they, could they speak? And then can I use them in my educational program? And then lastly, I want to go back to what Tracy Wang said. Uh, it's really important that your mentors also make those introductions because they already have this great respect and relationship with industry, usually with a mentor who's working with industry. And those introductions go a very, very long way. So if your mentor is open and um, not just Supporting everything and wanting to share in the successes and, and they make that kind of an introduction. It does go for a very, very long way. And I think it's really, really important. So I want to just quickly switch gears for the next 
10 minutes that we have, 12 minutes that we have is talk about a little bit of that conflict of interest, that horrible negative, the, 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 the dark side, you know, industry in the dark side and the perception of the conflicts and um, this negative ripple effect. What do you all make of that? Linda, why don't we start with you? How do you, um, how do you respond to physicians who may be reticent to, uh, to join because of the conflicts and um, um, the negative sort of uh, output that comes from that or reputation that comes from that, from working with industry? Well, how do you, how do you uh, what do you think about that? It's, it's uh, that's a great question. I think, you know, uh, going, coming over to the dark side 15 years ago, you know, I was part of that. And, you know, and I, very early on, people said, oh, you're going over to the dark side. And once I went over to the dark side, I realized there's a whole lot of passion behind everybody in industry. You know, we will work so hard to make sure everybody's goals are met to just make sure that we reach more customers, we reach more patients. But I think it, 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 has to happen in in a venue that is a kind of a safe respectable place you know once they know the um once we know their their interest and their passions and we we ask them what they would like to be involved with um there's a fly i feel like pence with the fly <laughs> um but you know i i <laughs> of course right so um so i think you know I think the fears of being perceived as working with the dark side in terms of, you know, maybe, you know, the clinician's um, intentions would be perceived as disingenuous or, you know, of the wrong intentions. I think a lot of that really, I feel has, has really dissipated over the years. And I, I, I think it came along with the evolution of the Sunshine Act, right? We clearly just established clear boundaries for everybody. And, and since the, the boundaries were set, I think we demystified a lot of the, you know, the evil intentions that come with maybe partnering with industry. And I think once they see all the different avenues that we can help support them in, it really does, um, you know, dispel a lot of those those misperceptions that exist, you know, especially when you start getting deeper into a company and you realize that there is a tremendous maybe medical science department or a tremendous research and development department that really wants to partner with people or, you know, and it's, and once I think clinicians see that the perception, you know, that the reality is, is that we want to do things jointly to move a therapy together with each other, I think we dispel a lot of those misperceptions. But I, I truly believe I've seen a complete shift in the last 15 years where that is no longer as palpable as it was maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Michelle, how do you how do you respond to that? Yeah, I, I think the key is, I think as your, uh, the, your guest in the video said, it, it's really about transparency. It's really about communication. And I think sharing, you know, we, when we have conversations with physicians who might be, well, I'm fearful, it, it's sort of understand why. So I'll give you a quick example. We had a physician who was afraid that her patients would find out, well, you know, I got, you know, X amount of money from a company. What, how do I explain that? And so we put her in contact with one of her peers who very, you know, eloquently and simply described what you've heard today, which is, the partnership with industry benefits patients. It helps us do science and advance science like we couldn't do alone in an academic center. And so really kind of being transparent and sharing kind of what your fears are if you have them. So because there have been people before you who probably had the same concerns. And so, you know, helping people feel comfortable. But I do think transparency, I think um, making sure you're clear about what, you know, you um, where those boundaries are, as your um, as your guest said, and then where you can share with us why. So we want to make sure that we don't unintentionally offend the people that we collaborate with. So the why or the context really helps us, right? So we can make sure we're we're focusing our effort where you as clinicians and as scientists have an interest, and where you don't, right? So because we realize everyone's time is very valuable, so. Yeah, and, and kind of talking about the boundaries, um, uh, I think that physicians know about those boundaries. They, um, you know, if it doesn't feel right, I always say, if it doesn't feel right, then just don't do it. And and uh, if this feels like um, too good to be true, as Noel said, 
um, it's not, it's probably a marketing ploy. And, and there are, you know, there are different divisions. And I think it always makes a great deal of sense for academicians and those who are doing trial work and educational work, as well as, um, you know, funding for trials and getting into as a key opinion leader to really work on the medical science part of things rather than the marketing part. And there is a very important distinction. You know, the marketing group has to do their job in marketing the product. Uh, and so when uh, you, uh, as a physician, kind of pass the boundary of working with the marketing group, then you have passed the boundary. And so how do you, um, and I mean, that's sort of my advice uh, to really clear cut, understand. And sometimes it's really not easy for physicians to know, uh, well, oh, I talked to somebody from Abbott uh, and you, there's clearly two different, very, very with firewalls, in fact, between them where they don't talk to each other because of the regulations such that science is separated from the marketing side. And if you really want to keep that boundary. I think that's one of the things to make sure that you ask that you're working on the scientific side of things. And there's nothing wrong to work on the marketing side if you actually believe in a product and you've done the work and your trial comes out and it's showing really great things. And as long as you feel confident in the data and that you're being balanced in the presentation, even working in that side is not... Um, is it, it could it could lead to adherence. It could help, uh, you know, improve health outcomes, especially if something is is working. So tell us a little bit about some of those boundaries. Let's start with you, Paul, and then we'll go to Bobby. How do you set? How do you work with clinicians to set the boundaries, and what are you doing internally to make sure that those boundaries are not crossed? Yeah, great, great question, Roxana. Part part of it you've alluded to and probably similar for my peers here, it's organizational structure. So there's a structure internally that most, if not all of us have, that try to separate church and state between where education sits and where the commercial aspects of our businesses sit. So for us on the education side, we tend to sit outside of those commercial boundaries, usually where um, uh, our clinical team sit, our educational team sit, our our regulatory team sit, and that's intentional because one, we want to ensure that those boundaries are created, uh, but it's not just, it shouldn't just be optically, it should just be from an integrity standpoint, uh, first and foremost, right? We all should have a moral compass that drives the interactions that we have with our clinicians. And a big part of that is going back to having that um, candid, transparent discussion around partnerships. What is it that you want to accomplish? What do we want to accomplish and make sure that that's very uh, clearly delineated in terms of what that entails to ensure that on both sides that we know exactly what we're, we're signing up for. Um, for us, we, we try to ensure that anytime we engage in an educational partnership, that there's actually a need there. So we're not bringing on any um, thought leaders um, to educate for us, to do trials for us, if no clear clinical or educational need has not been established first and foremost, because one, it's not a value, whether ethical or not, it's not a value to our side. It shouldn't be a value to our thought leaders and our clinicians on, on their side as well. So uh, for us, and again, and probably for all of my peers as well, is the discussions beyond the organizational structure start off with very candid partnership related discussions to ensure that we're aligned in terms of what we want to accomplish. And I hope for all of us at the end of the day, it's that we want to bring better care to patients globally, right? That's why we all got into it. We chose different roles in terms of how we do that, but you know, our goals really don't change. And for us, um, that really is the driving force for what we do is we want to ensure that we're providing good education that leads to good um, outcomes because first and foremost, it's do no harm. Right? When we educate is to do no harm, whether it's on the industry side or on the clinician side. And if you kind of take that as your, as your uh, true north, as your guiding um, uh, compass of sorts, then I, I think our discussions have a lot of mutual um, uh, uh, agreement in terms of how we want to approach relationships. Oh, wonderful, Paul. That's just so well said. Uh, Bobby? Setting boundaries. How do you help? Uh, how do you help clinicians uh, 
to make sure those boundaries are not crossed um, with Abiomed. Well, certainly, it's hard, right? Because your patient group is is really very, very sick, and um, you know, uh, it's it's really hard not to get passionate about saving a life. Uh, restoring heart of a, of, of a patient who would otherwise uh, not do well. And you, your device has helped tremendously. So it's hard not to, not to get excited about that. So how do you guys set those boundaries? Um, one, one of the aspects uh, that Abiumed did, Roxana, is to create Camp PCI, which is a, a very formal educational process. It goes through uh, varying from patient selection to technique aspects to hemodynamics. And it brought together um, a, a very diverse uh, faculty um, to develop the curriculum for that in a very organized, structured manner and uh, to present the information that is available online to those who would like to enroll in the Camp PCI um, educational forum. So that way it's not, uh, it's not as much of a marketing event, it's purely focused on education. And with each one of the faculty members, uh, those goals were clearly outlined and the content that they were to develop was uh, put to a peer review within the camp faculty before it was ever made available. Um, the other way is with live case presentations. Um, again, that's uh, live uh, on Wednesdays and a very clear cut uh, conversation yeah. occurs with those physicians um, so that uh, it's clear on both sides what's expected. And the, the end result is education and enhancing best practices. No, there's no question, and, and I love working with Abiomed, by the way. We, I've worked with Abiomed for many, many years now and uh, have found a, a great relationship, and they're very respectful when, when you as a clinician feel uncomfortable with something. They're extremely respectful, and I've, uh, I applaud you and the leadership there for the work you're doing. But let me just quickly go through three excellent questions that have come through, and I'm hoping that are my our attendees, I really want it. it says, how can a fellow in training be involved? And I would say, absolutely. I'm sure that um, that um, uh, industry is often looking for the the young stallion or young women who will want to be um, getting involved in in this important next new technologies. You are the future. Fellows are the future. Uh, and there's no question that I would believe that there is a very, very important uh, way, but they want to know how could they get involved and in what way, how can fellows connect and also build relationships for the future when they transition into their own practices. Um, so I know that there are fellow training courses, all of you have them. Uh, I don't know about BMS. Mich Michelle, how are you working with fellows? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Roxanne. So, so we are working, um, you know, as we partner with organizations to make sure we can connect fellows. Um, and then we're working through programs to offer BMS fellowships as well to bring people um, so they understand what we're working on. So I, I think you're right. They're absolutely you know, part of the future. And I would say, you know, again, through as they, as fellows meet um, representatives, you know, medical teams from the companies is again, share that interest um, and making sure um, that we understand where, where the needs really are. And then we're, the other, we, we're looking at it both sort of formally and informally. No, it's fantastic. And then the other very, very, who wants to take this one, uh, it's a tough one. Uh, I mean, we, we keep talking about women and underrepresented minorities, but here's a question. How can minority women being more engaged? Um, you know, we hardly ever see them in any of the key opinion leaders and any as a principal investigator of a trial. How, how could they be more engaged? Who wants to take that? Paul? Yeah, sure. Honestly, uh, thank you for asking the question. And my advice would be in similar channels that we've discussed here. I, I think there's a, a lot of opportunity, either from a, a mentorship standpoint at the institution that you're practicing or, or being trained at. Uh, societies, I, I 
do believe have recognized that there's a gap there and, and certainly an opportunity as we all have um, society relationship aspects of what we do. And I think societies play a significant role in connecting um, those that want to participate with industry with the, the right aspects of the industry itself. So I would highly encourage you, uh, depending on the society that you're a part of or societies that you want to explore, that they are taking a much more active role in this particular area. And uh, I think that's probably an underutilized resource to be quite honest, because I think there's a lot of resources there. And every society to my knowledge actually has their own industry relations department as well. And I think just like the mentors can make that formal introduction, we all have some very close relationships with those um, society relations partners as well. They're also a, a great avenue to make introduction to your industry partners. So if you have a particular area that you're interested in, that you want to either do trials in or speak in or educate in, um, seek us out, find your society partners or industry relations partners. Um, they're great at making connections. I know the ones that I work yeah. with have introduced me to uh, a lot of folks that well, want to connect. My, my advice to minority women is join our talent directory at Women as One. We are a source of information. We will be sharing and working very, very closely with our industry colleagues in helping engaging the right opportunity to the right woman at the right time. Please go in the talent directory and register. Put your information there. Enter your CV. It helps us make those matches. This is all that we do. Uh, and we're not, we have no agenda except to, to help promote talent in, in, in medicine. Um, two more quick questions, uh, Ali, before you take me away. Um, I, I want to answer all the questions. You know how I am. And, and it says, um, I recently entered uh, this realm uh, and had a casual conversation with a pharma VP. So this is for you, Michelle. What are you looking for? Is the conversation a test of some sort? Um, I hope it's not a test. I, I, it should be a genuine conversation in terms of what are you interested in? How do we collaborate? Um, it goes back to the conversation we were having before. There should be transparency in that conversation. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay positive and say the hope was really to get yeah. to know the person, again, understand what they're interested in. Um, I, I think and then, you know, as a as a VP, I would say thinking about how do we connect this person back into the organization. So I think your one of your other questions, Roxana, if someone comes to me with a medical or a clinical trial conversation, part of my responsibility is to point them in and connect them with the right person on the R and D side. Um, but then that's where my you know, and and then the, let the R and D team take on that responsibility. Yeah. So I think it's. I'm hoping it was really about just learning more about the person because I think yeah, we're all and I people. would say <laughs> stop having imposter syndrome. It's because you're wonderful, and that's exactly. why they want to have a conversation with you. And this is what it is. You know, we often as women feel like, well, why would a VP want to even talk to me? Is he testing me or whatever? It's because you're amazing, and I know exactly who you are. Um, and so I, I know that you are amazing. So it's, it's wonderful that you asked that. And then lastly, and then we'll close this, go back to you, Ali. Um, it, it, the question is dictating uh, slides to be used by a company. And I'll tell you, I, uh, I too feel uncomfortable. And I, I can tell you that um, if you are to remember one thing, there are really, really important guidelines that... Um, industry has to follow. And those are regulatory guidelines around the use of promotion of their devices uh, or, or drugs based on regulation. And the reason why they dictate the slides is because they wanna make sure that legally they're absolutely fit the bill on what it is that they're saying. These are not marketing slides, but what can be said on a slide and especially what can't be said where there needs to be protection against what can't be said, especially regarding off-label use of a drug and a device. So I often take that with a grain of salt. I never let um, industry dictate what I say and what I do. And when there is that kind of a very strict to speak only about uh, the, the, what they can promote, and, and Linda, you can, you can pitch in here if I'm off, um, then what I do is I let them uh, 
I, I will let them uh, to uh, uh, to give themselves a uh, opportunity to review my slide, uh, the my slide set for as long as it takes, and hopefully it passes the muster. Um, but if you're very uncomfortable, you are never ever pushed to to use that, and you can say sorry, I I, I will not do that, and and they they accept that, and they'll find other. Uh, opportunities for you to speak at. I, I don't think you should worry that you will lose your opportunity. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Linda Menarchek, uh, Paul Hyatt, Michelle uh, Kalopa, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> and uh, and Bobby Begave. Uh, wonderful, wonderful to have you all spending time with us. Um, I know that our audience utterly enjoyed this. This will be on, on our website and I'll now turn it to you, Ali, who Great. orchestrated this whole thing. So thank you for all of your efforts in leading this, these, uh, these series. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Roxana. And a huge thank you to everyone who participated tonight, all of our panelists. This is an, a really interesting discussion. And I know everyone is really excited to, to hear this and to see this. So. Thank you all and to everyone who tuned in tonight, wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for taking an hour of your time to uh, participate in this. And yeah, please sign up for the Women is One Talent Directory and you can find this and then all of the other Leadership Academy videos on our talent directory and on our YouTube channel. 